The next section in the chapter on European and American art in the period from 1715 to 1840, that section is titled Neoclassicism and Early Romanticism in Britain. I want to kind of walk you through the structure here because this seems simple enough. They're going to talk about these two things, but actually when you dig in, it gets really complicated. They're moving to Britain, so we've got another geographic focus. That's clear enough. But once they get to Britain, they're starting to juggle a lot of balls. So I'm going to try to give you a little overview of what's happening with the juggling. So the first ball is really talking about classicism or neoclassicism as it pertains to Britain, how we have a classical revival in architecture. So that's where, where they lead off and they show you Chiswick House to get you understanding how aristocrats in 18th century Britain, such as the Earl of Burlington, are interested in building these kind of gracious estates using the language of classicism, using columns organized in a clear rhythmic um, form, using symmetry, using clear geometric forms like an octagon, a dome, rectangles. All of this is the hallmark of classicism. And actually, this thread of classicism weaves through the chapter. You have to skip ahead to the section on painting. So look at, I'm clicking through till you get to portraiture to see, not the satiric spirit, but classicizing portraiture to see an example of a portrait painted of Lady Sarah Bunbury, another aristocratic woman in Britain, painted by the famous Sir Joshua Reynolds and painted in a garment that was the style of the time, flowing soft cloth meant to resemble the robes and togas of ancient Rome. And she's shown as if she is in ancient Rome, as if she's making a ritual offering to the three graces. So there's a kind of a, a kind of fantasy revival of the Roman past and identifying with the culture, the people, the life at that time. So I've actually jumped forward to pursue the theme of classicism from architecture to painting. But let's go back because that's not how the authors structured it, right? So I'm wanting you to really think about the structure of this chapter, otherwise it gets confusing. So they started off talking about classical revival in architecture and design, and then they talk about a different kind of revival, Gothic revival. This can be a little bit confusing, so I want to say a few words here about revival. I talked about neoclassicism as involving, a, as involving an emerging historical consciousness or a heightened historical consciousness. We talked about the 17th century as the beginning of the modern world, the early modern period. Where pe and that means partly that people see themselves as sort of in different from what came before, different from the tradition and ancestors that preceded them. This is familiar to us. We think of ourselves as different from people who were born even, you know, 20 years before us, let alone 100 years before us. The flip side of this kind of sense of being a modern a person of a, a new time, is an interest in the past, a kind of nostalgic longing for the past, as well as a curiosity and a kind of appreciation of the past. So along with the past of Greece and Rome, there was a tremendous interest in Britain in the mid-18th century in the medieval world. So the term Gothic revival uses an, a, a confusing term. Gothic in art history refers to a style of art and architecture that belongs to a period of time. So here's Google. If you search Gothic cathedrals, you see that it's a style of sacred architecture, cathedrals that were built in the 1200s, the 1300s, even a little bit into the 1400s a style of elaborate ornamentation of stonework in which the 
walls of the building seem to become lace and in which stained glass is used to dematerialize the walls and create a kind of radiant light. So what happens is that around 1764, you get someone like Horace Walpole fascinated with the lost world of the Middle Ages. And he actually, <clears throat> excuse me, publishes The Castle of Otranto. And this is considered the first Gothic novel. So Gothic is a genre of literature, a genre of literature that deals often with horror, with fantasy, the supernatural, and his novel is set in the Middle Ages. He also builds for himself a massive estate that is meant to look like a, a castle from the Middle Ages, a kind of fantasy reenactment of the past. And then if you go, oops, meant to go back. If you scroll down, you see that his interiors have all this ornamentation that mimics the elaborate fan vaulting of Gothic cathedrals. So I want you to see the 18th century as being this time when philosophers like Diderot are breaking from tradition, breaking from the Catholicism that gave birth to Gothic cathedrals and creating new ideas about that will lead to new forms of government. Yet there's also a kind of counterpole, a fascination with the past, a fascination with it that leads to kind of fantasy recreations of a Gothic interior. So there's another ball. Here's a third ball. They're introducing something that is so opposite to both classical architecture and Gothic revival architecture. They're, they're introducing an iron bridge, an industrial aesthetic, a functional aesthetic that's about using modern materials, iron, to create a more efficient transportation route for the purpose of making products and making money. So this bridge stands for the transformation of society by industrial wealth. And if you skip then to the next section where they talk about British painting, this subheading, the satiric spirit, is showing you a painting, a very amusing painting by Hogarth. But the really important issue within this painting is how we are seeing a class structural change. Now you've got a large and affluent middle class, the middle, these people who build the bridge to send their goods far away for selling and making money. They have disposable income. And William Hogarth is not just capitalizing on this new market, he's actually representing the transformation of society when you have a old money aristocrat, those who inherit title and wealth going back to the Middle Ages based on a feudal system of land ownership versus this young lady's papa, who's understood to be an industrialist with new money, making his money by hustling his products across those iron bridges. And Hogarth is showing you that this arranged marriage, which is all about money meeting property and title, the two fathers are hammering out which family is gonna get what to make this marriage a profitable event for both parties. It's not at all about what she wants, certainly not. And he doesn't really care because we're supposed to understand that he's just a ridiculous, decadent, aristocratic fool. Okay, the last ball, the fourth ball, we have to skip ahead as these balls are being juggled till we come to this idea of romance. Oh, they, they inserted this little part about the academies and romantic painting. Romanticism in Britain. Wait, I'm not there yet. I'm on history painting. Romantic painting and this idea of romanticism. This is the best example. Romanticism is emerging 
at this point. And it's going to be a massively influential course of artistic thinking that will be in some sense, some senses, the opposite to neoclassicism, although they will also actually in some odd ways be in a kind of dance with each other. To a great extent, neoclassicism is the opposite of romanticism, as you can see when you look at David David versus Fuseli's The Nightmare, right? So the David painting is about public virtue. This is about a private fantasy world, a nightmare, a sexualized nightmare that involves a kind of an imp incubus, a kind of gargoyle figure squatting on the pelvis of this woman who's sprawling, surrendering, possibly dead, possibly in a kind of orgasm. And then there's this freaky horse, which if you were to sit down with Dr. Freud, he would say that is phallic. That's a penis symbol. So this is all about sexuality, the irrational parts of the mind, fear and erotic desire. This is about the opposite from discipline, control, tradition, virtue. And stylistically, there's a kind of free flowing quality that has, is nothing like these controlled measured lines. When you're having a nightmare about sex with an ogre, the lines are not in control. Nothing's in control. So there are a number of stylistic features that go with romanticism, but we should also see them as being about a challenge to enlightenment philosophy's emphasis on reason on logic. So Goethe's book, The Sorrows of Young Werther, the textbook mentions it. It's a coming of age story about a failure to adjust to coming of age, about being a sensitive soul who basically ends his life because of forbidden love and despair, a misfit in society. The troubled individual who is alone is a hallmark of romantic thought and romantic imagery. But Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is also a romantic novel, a horror novel, and it's romantic because it flips upside down the claims of science to reveal the workings of nature in a rational way that liberates human beings. It suggests that there is there are irrational forces that pulse through human life that are dangerous and uncontrollable, even if you're a scientist named Frankenstein. 